Well, let's get started. Uh, thank, thanks for coming despite the rain. Uh, but, you know, uh, at, at least we can, we can feel lucky that the sun ro rose today because we, we have a lot more to do and it'll be hard to do if the sun, sun stopped rising. So, okay, so we were talking about MGFs last time. Uh, we've done all the theory that we need for M MGFs, but I, I'm not sure that the intuition is clear enough yet and there are some important examples. So I just want to start with a few examples of M MGFs. But we already have all the theorems. Um, okay. Especially, you know, what are the, how, how do we work with MGFs for, for some of the most important distributions such as exponential, normal, and Poisson, just to show you how the MGFs are, are useful for, for some of the, those famous distributions. Okay, so let's start with the exponential. And uh, we talked before about, uh, so this is the Expo MGF. Uh, we talked before about the fact that if we have exponential lambda, we can always find a constant to multiply by to make it exponential one. So let's just start with the exponential one case because that's simpler, that is lambda equals one. Let x be exponential one. And, and suppose that we want to find the, find the MGF and find the moments, okay? Find moments. And this will really show you what, why it's called the moment generating function. Oh, that doesn't actually, I didn't talk about what, where did the word moment come from. Uh, it, it comes from physics, so those of you who have done like moment of inertia and stuff, that, that, there's like an analogy, there's actually a pretty strong analogy between variance and moment of inertia. That doesn't answer the question for where did the word moment come from in physics, but you can ask the physicist that. But it came into statistics via physics because of this analogy with moment of inertia. Anyway, uh, so we have an exponential, okay, and, and so let's find the MGF. Well, uh, by, by Lotus, uh, that's a pretty easy calculation, M of t. Uh, remember, just by definition, it's just the expected value of e to the tx. And this is, uh, you know, this is a perfectly valid thing to write down. This e to the tx, that's just some random variable. We're taking its expectation, and then we're viewing this as a function of t. And I pointed out last time t is a dummy variable, so I could have just as well said m of s equals expected e to the t e to the sx, or whatever, whatever you want to call it that doesn't clash. <clears throat> the interpretation is just that this is a very, very useful bookkeeping device for keeping track of moments, and it's another way to describe a distribution rather than a CDF or a PDF. Okay, so let's just compute this thing. Well, this is an easy Lotus problem, because by Lotus, we can just immediately say this is the integral zero to infinity, e to the tx, e to the minus x, dx. Right, that's just immediate from Lotus. Combine the two exponentials, so that's e to the minus x times one minus t dx. So that's just, that's just an easy in integral, right? So that, that integral, well actually one, w one way to do it is just to do the integral. Another way to do this integral is to, is to recognize this as another exponential PDF with a different parameter and put in the normalizing constant and you'll get one over one minus t, and this is for t less than one. If t is bigger than one, we have some problems here, because like if you let t be two, for example, then that would be one minus two is negative one. You get e to the positive x, which would blow up. But as long as t is less than one, this will be okay. It'll be exponential decay, not exponential growth. So, so we have to assume t less than one, uh, but that's okay because, you know, we talked last time about the fact that we wanted to have some interval, like for, I called it minus a to, to a, on, on which this is finite. So in this case, it's finite everywhere to the left of, of one, right? So in particular, you could take some interval, like say, minus one to, to one open interval on which it's finite. So, so this is a perfectly valid MGF. Um, okay. So now we want to get the moments, right? So... Um, you know, from what I said last time, we, we, could start take, we could take this thing one over one minus t and start taking derivatives. So, and plug in zero. So it would be true that m prime of zero would be the mean, and m double prime of zero would be the second moment. And once we have this and this, we could easily get the variance. Uh, we, we, are, we already talked about the, the mean and the variance of the exponential, so, so you could do this and, and check that it agrees with what we did earlier through Lotus. 
Okay, and then the third moment would be the third derivative evaluated at zero, and so on, right? So we could do that, but that's kind of annoying in the sense that we have to keep taking derivatives. Now, for this function, taking a bunch of derivatives is not too bad, okay? But it's still, a much better way to do this is to, is to recognize the pattern, right? A lot of this is about pattern recognition, okay? Where have we seen 1 over 1 minus t before? Geometric series, right? We keep using the Taylor series for e to the x and geometric series over and over again. It can go in both directions, right? You can have the, the geometric series result and write it as a geometric series, or you can have a geometric series and simplify it to this. Anytime you see 1 over 1 minus something, you should be thinking that that, that may have something to do with the geometric series. That may be a useful interpretation, it may not, but at least that the idea should pop into your mind just because you see this pattern, okay? So if, if we do that, we get 1 over 1 minus t equals just a geometric series, the sum t to the n, n equals 0 to infinity. And this is valid for, 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 for t greater than, for an absolute value of t less than 1. That's when this converges. By writing it this way, we don't actually have to do derivatives. All, we're just looking at, the, at this series, okay? And then, and then we're just gonna read off the moments. Um, so the only thing we have to be careful about is the n factorial. Because, because I said with the, the, the MGF, you, you take the, expan the Taylor expansion and the, the, the moment is whatever is in front of t to the n over n factorial. I don't see an n factorial here. But that's no problem, right? You just multiply and divide by n factorial, because we need the n factorial there. So I'll just, I'll just multiply by n factorial, t to the n over n. Now, n factorial, now this matches exactly the pattern that, that we talked about last time, about you know, whatever's in front of the t to the n over n factorial, that's the nth moment. So, so that's the nth moment. So we immediately know now that e of x to the n equals n factorial for all n. So instead of taking derivatives over and over again, we, we simultaneously get all the moments of x, okay? So that's nice, right? Didn't, didn't need to take any derivatives. Um, so that, by the way, that's kind of like the, the coolest thing about MGFs is the fact that if you, just, just in general, not necessarily for this example, if you want to find the moments of some distribution, by lotus, you would think you have to integrate, right? You want e of x to the n, so you're going to integrate x to the n times a PDF. That may be an incredibly difficult in integral. But the MGFs, once you have the MGF, we're taking derivatives, not integrals. So it's pretty surprising, to me at least, that you can do derivatives of the MGF rather than integrals of powers of x. Derivatives are much easier usually than integrals, so, so that, that can save a, a lot of work. Uh, so let's just quickly see what happens if it's exponential lambda, uh, where lambda is not necessarily 1. So now let, let's let y be exponential lambda. And then let, let's just convert it, just, just, to, just to see how to apply this. Um, convert it, well, exponential, and so we talked before about the fact that if, if you multiply or divide by lambda, and it may be hard to remember should you multiply by lambda or divide by lambda, but there's an easy way to see that. Let's just let x equal lambda y. Um, so I, I knew to multiply by lambda rather than dividing because we know that ex exponential lambda has mean 1 over lambda. So if you multiply by lambda, now this has mean 1. And we showed that this is, in fact, exponential of 1. So we've converted it to this case. In other words, y equals x over lambda, and we can take nth powers. So now we immediately have the moment of uh, the nth moment of y. Expected value of y to the n equals expected value of x to the n, which is n factorial, divided by lambda to the n. Okay? So I didn't do any calculus here. I only used the geometric series. Um, and it's just, you know, we, we could have directly done something similar to this uh, for, for y, but I think it's easier working with the exponential one and then, then converting it back. Similarly, at the end of last time, 
we derived the MGF of the standard normal, okay? Now, if you want, you want any normal mu sigma squared, then you just write it mu plus sigma z, right? And then, then, then you, know, you, can, you can get its MGF very easily. So a lot of times it's easier to work with the standard normal. Okay, so speaking of standard normal, let, let's, let's actually get the normal moments now. We already know the odd moments. So here, so, so the problem is, you know, let, let z be standard normal and fi find all its moments. Okay? We, al we already know that the first moment is zero and the second moment is one because it means zero variance one. We already know that the odd moments are all zero. That's just by symmetry. Uh, we, we mentioned that, that fact before, but you, know, you should ch check for yourself that that makes sense uh, that, you know, to practice the symmetry. Because, you, because if you write down the integral using lotus, you, you, you would be integrating an odd function symmetrically about zero, so the negative area cancels the positive area. So you don't need to do any work to, to get this. Just use symmetry. Even moments, though, that seems pretty hard. I mean, we, we already know e of z squared from, and, and we did that, you know, you, by, by doing some integration stuff. Now, if you want e of z to the fourth, you know, if you use lotus, you're going to have to integrate z to the fourth times the normal PDF. How, how do you do that integral? I don't know. I mean, you can try doing some substitutions. You can try doing integration by parts. And, you know, you could easily sp spend a couple hours doing that integral. And it's possible to do it, but it's not easy. It'll be a lot of work. And that would just be the fourth moment. And then you could say, well, what about the sixth moment? What about the eighth moment? Right? So that, that's not a very, very efficient way to do things, just doing a lot of nasty looking integrals. OK, so let's use the MGF instead. The MGF uh, that we derived last time is the function m of t equals e to the t squared over 2. So that at least gives us an approach to, to getting the moments that doesn't involve having to figure out how to do these integrals, OK? It, it, it's, it's something more straightforward. You, you know, like for derivatives, we have the chain rule, the product rule, and so on. There's, there's no chance that you can't do this derivative if you, know, it, you know, if, if you know your chain rule and product rule and stuff like that, whereas for integration, you may just not know how to do the integral. Okay? Uh, so we could take the derivative of this, use the chain rule, and, and we're, you know, we're going to get a t that, that comes out uh, in front because of the chain rule. And then we take the second derivative, and then, because then there's going to be a t out there after the first derivative. And then we'd have to use the product rule. Okay? And then we take another derivative. And then, you know, you have two terms, and then the terms start, you know, multiplying, and you get more and more terms to deal with, and it would get more and more tedious and ugly the more derivatives we took. It's still something that, you know, you, you can do, just it's pretty mechanical, but, it, but it's tedious, and we want to avoid tedious stuff, okay? So, so here's a much better way to think about it. Um, over there with the exponential, I, I emphasize just the p pattern recognition geometric series. Let's, let's apply the same thinking again. Pattern recognition, this is e to a power, okay? The Taylor series, unlike the geometric series, the Taylor series for e to the x converges everywhere. So I can immediately just write down the Taylor series for this without taking any derivatives. This is just the sum of t uh, squared over 2 to the n over n factorial. Right? Because the Taylor series for e to the x is valid everywhere, so in particular, I can plug in t squared over 2. Okay? So this is a much, much better way to do it than to start taking derivatives of this. Uh, so let's simplify this. This is the sum. Uh, notice that we're only going to get even powers of t, which, which makes sense because this, this is an even function. So it's going to be t to the 2n. and there's a 1 over 2 to the n in, in the denominator, and, the, and there's an n factorial. OK? So that, that's what it is. Now, same as over there. We just have to read off the moments. The only thing you have to be careful about is the fact that there's a 2n here in the exponent, and there's an n factorial there. So there's kind of a mismatch right now. OK? To, to, get, the, to get the 2nth moment, we want the 2nth uh, moment. Because 2, 2n is just an arbitrary, you know, even number. Okay, 
So we want the 2nth moment. So the 2nth moment, we want the coefficient of t of the 2n over 2n factorial. We don't have a 2n factorial. Oh, well, that's okay, just put in 2n factorial. As long as we multiply by that, it's okay. So I just multiplied and divided by 2n factorial. It immediately tells us the answer. The expected value of z to the 2n, so that's just an arbitrary even moment. We already have the odd moments. Is just the coefficient of t to the 2n over 2n factorial. That's everything that's left. That's 2n factorial over 2 to the n n factorial. And let's, ju let's just check whether this makes sense in, in, in the cases we know. Um, if, if n equals 1, n equals 1, this is 2 factorial over 2 times 2. Wait, n equals 1, so 2 times 1. OK, so, so that's 2 divided by 2 times 1 is, is 1. So e of z squared equals 1. And that's what we expected, because the variance is 1. And let's, ju let's just do a a couple more, n equals 2. So e of, then we get the fourth moment, z to the fourth. n equals 2, 4 factorial is 24 divided by 8. 24 divided by 8 is 3. So the fourth moment is 3. And um, the next one, e of z to the sixth, is going to be 3 times 5 equals 15. And, and you'll see, I'll write it as 1 times 3 times 5. You'll see the pattern is one, if it's 1, 1 times 3, 1 times 3 times 5, 1 times 3 times 5 times, times 7, and, and so on. And this is not the first time that, that we've seen these numbers, or at least if you've done the strategic practice problems go, going way back. That was the number of ways to, to break 2n people into, into n partnerships. And there was a story problem there. We could either write it this way or as a product of, of odd numbers. Um, so, kind of a surprising fact, or at least I, I found it really surprising that the, the same expression comes up for even moments of the normal as, as it's the same number as, as breaking up people into partnerships and counting number of ways to do that. And I thought that was kind of mysterious. It turns out that it's not a coincidence, but there's, there's kind of a very deep combinatorial explanation for that, which I can't get into, but, but there is a reason for that. Anyway, th 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 that, that gives us all the moments of the normal distribution now without doing any calculus. So that, 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 that's nice. OK, so uh, one more MGF problem. We haven't talked yet in class about the MGF of the Poisson distribution. So let, let's, let's do that. Uh, so, you know, Poisson. We, we know that the mean is Poisson lambda. We know it has mean lambda and variance lambda, but we haven't computed any other moments. But mainly for the Poisson, I wanted to show you the other, like I said last time, why there, there are three reasons why the MGF is important. And, and, and those examples to illustrate the, the, the fact that, you know, why it's a moment generating, because we, we, we generated all the moments. Okay? Well, uh, but for the Poisson, I want to show you the, you know, the other important reasons. So let's let uh, x be Poisson lambda and find its MGF again. Well, let's just use Lotus. The expected value of e to the tx equals the sum. So Poisson takes non-negative integer values. So I'll just say k equals 0 to infinity. e to the tk, all right, it's just, just, just Lotus, e to the, and then times the Poisson uh, PMF, e to the minus lambda, lambda to the k over k factorial. Okay, looks like a kind of ugly uh, sum. Um, well, actually, you'll find that, that this sum is an example on the math re review handout, so I was planning far in, in advance. Um, well, we, but, you know, you don't have to memorize that or anything. This is, just an, this is just another example of pattern recognition dealing with a s series. It looks a little ugly when you first see it, but this is actually e easy once, you, you know, once you're familiar with, with the pattern, right? So e to the minus lambda comes out because that's just a constant. Look at what's left inside. Um, we have, you know, this is e to the t to the k, and this is lambda to the k. So together, that's lambda e to the t to the k, right? 
So, so all, all that's left is something, the sum of something to the k over k factorial. That's just the Taylor series for e to the x again. So this is very easy you know, once, once you've mastered the Taylor series for e to the x. So we can just immediately write, write that down then. It's the Taylor series for e to the x evaluated at x equals lambda e to the t. Okay? So we can simplify that a little bit. It's e to the lambda e to the t minus 1. So that's the Poisson MGF. Um, and it's va valid for, for all values of, of t because, because the, the series converges for all t. Um, OK, so that's the Poisson MGF. So one thing we could do with it is to start taking derivatives or, or, um, or trying to expand it or, or whatever to, to get the moments. But I'm, but I'm, but I, I'm not doing this example because I want to do moments. So I want to show you the other applications of MGF. So now let's let y be Poisson of mu. So we, so, we don't, so we have two Poissons now, not one Poisson. And suppose that x and y are independent. And the problem is find the distribution of x plus y. So we want to study the sum of two independent Poissons. Okay. So that's called a convolution. And we'll, we'll come back to convolutions l later on in the semester, but you know, it, in general it can be nasty. But, but I pointed out last time that for MGFs, you can just multiply the MGFs. That, that, that's easy, whereas doing a, a sum or integral could, could be pretty nasty. Okay. So all we have to do is multiply the MGFs. That is, I'm just going to take the MGF of x times the MGF of y. Uh, so here's the MGF of x, e to the lambda, e to the t minus 1. MGF of y is going to be the same thing, except, except that the parameter is now called mu instead of lambda. So that's going to be e to the mu, e to the t minus 1 equals, and let's just simplify it, that's e to the lambda plus mu, factor that out, e to the t minus 1. That immediately tells us that x plus y is Poisson lambda plus mu. Because of the fact, we didn't prove this theorem. I, as I said, that's a really difficult theorem. But, but that is a theorem that th this, this is, the, is the Poisson lambda plus mu MGF. There's no other distribution that has the same MGF. So this is, therefore, the only possibility. Uh, by the way, it was obvious that the mean had to be lambda plus mu by linearity. So, so th this we already knew. The interesting part is that it's Poisson. The sum of independent Poissons is still Poisson. Uh, and most distributions don't have such a nice property. Like you, 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 know, you, know, you add uh, independent versions of them, and usually you get some, some, some other family. Here it's still within the Poisson family of distributions. Okay? So that's a very, very nice property of the Poisson. Uh, and a common mistake with this is to, is to ignore the assumption that x and y are independent. So, what, so to, to justify being able to just multiply the MGFs, we, we need x and y to be independent. So, so just, just to see a quick counterexample, uh, if, if they're not independent, if x and y are dependent, well, the, the, the most extreme case of dependence that I can think of is when x equals y. Okay, so let's just see why this doesn't work when x equals y. Well, obviously, if x equals y, then x plus y is 2x. And that's not Poisson. Why is that not Poisson? Yep. Okay, so, so, so that's a good way to think of it with the, with the MGF. If you take the MGF of this thing, you're, you're, you're going to get a 2 in, in there. And what are, what are you actually going to have? You're going to take expected value of e to the 2tx. So you would replace t by 2t. So you would get a 2t up there. And that doesn't look like a Poisson. Now, so, so that, that's close to a proof, but it's, but it's a little more complicated than I was thinking of. And you would still need to say, like, 
could there be some miracle of algebra that would reduce that back down to, it's, it's not true, right? If you put a two there, it's not of this form, but still, you know, what if you just didn't think of the brilliant algebraic way to simplify it down? Yeah. Yeah, that's the simplest way to, to see it. Well, so what she just said was, was that this thing is, is even. That, so that, that's one good way to see it. A Poisson has to take on any possible non-negative integer value. This thing is always an even number, so it couldn't possibly be Poisson. That's the simplest way to think about it, just, just looking at what are the possible values. Another way to see it would be to compute the variance, the mean and variance. So the expected value of x plus y, which is 2x, would be 2 lambda. So if it were Poisson, it would have to be Poisson 2 lambda, because that's the mean. But the variance of 2x is, is 4 lambda, because the 2 comes out squared. For a Poisson, the, the mean always equals the variance. For this thing, the variance is double. Intuitively, that should make sense, because you're adding the same thing to itself. That increases the variance compared to, if you add independent things, then you might expect, you know, if, if one thing happens to be very large, the other thing might offset it, right? But if you're adding the same thing to itself and it happens to be large, then you're adding the same large thing tw twice, okay? But I've seen that a similar mistake, so this is kind of like an easy counterexample, but I've seen similar mistakes in STAT 110 many, many, many times where, where maybe we have something like a sum of x1 plus x2 plus x3, and a student then just replaces them all by, by and their IID, and then a student replaces them all by x plus x plus x and, and get 3x, three, three but you know, x is not independent of itself. And, and, and that's the same mistake as, as this, so I wanted to mention that counterexample. Okay, so, and there's other ways to see it too, uh, but we just talked about three reasons why this was not Poisson. One using the MGF, one by looking at the possible values, one by looking at the mean and variance. So hopefully you're convinced now that that's not Poisson. Okay, so next uh, major topic in this course is, is joint distributions, that is, you know, something we, we've dealt with a little bit before, but just like bringing it in as, as its own topic in its own right. So joint distributions just means, you know, how do we work with a distribution of more than one random variable, okay? So that's why everything in this course is cumulative, right? Because if you don't fully understand the CDF of one random variable, then it's gonna be really hard to understand this, the joint CDF of more than one random variable. Okay, so joint distributions, you know, we've already talked about independence versus dependence, right? If you have, if you have independent random variables, then joint distribution just means mul multiply the individual CDFs or the individual PDFs, and it's pretty straightforward. You know, remember the slogan, independence means multiply, okay? But in general, you know, we, we, need, we need to have some tools and notation and so on for, for dealing with dependent random variables maybe just two of them, or may, maybe, you know, maybe a million of them. Okay, so, so we're gonna talk about joint distributions. And I think the best way to start is, is, is in the simplest case, where we have two random variables, and let's, just, let's even just say they're two binary random variables. So, so, so we, can, we can think of this in terms of two by two tables. And this may seem really, really simple. And I hope it seems pretty simple, because then if you understand this simple case really, really well, it'll give you a lot of intuition for the more complicated case. Okay, so I'll start with a simple one, where X and Y are Bernoulli's, possibly dependent, possibly independent, and possibly the same P, possibly different P's. I'm not saying they're both Bernoulli P with the same P. Okay, then we can think of this in terms of two by two tables. Um, so we could draw an example like, like this with a table and we could just tabulate values where here's x, x equals zero, x equals one, and y equals zero, uh, y equals one. Okay, and then to, to specify a joint distribution all we have to do is put in four numbers here that are non-negative and add up to one, right? And any four numbers you want, as long as they're non-negative and add up to one, that will be a valid joint distribution. So remember for, you know, PMFs, to be valid, a PMF, just non-negative, adds up to one. 
completely analogous. It just now, now it's in two dimensions instead of one dimension. Okay, so we could just make up four numbers that add up to one. And I guess we're going to talk about some of the general definitions here. So if we, so th th this is for the specific case, but let's also talk about the general case. Uh, so if we have x and y, they're, 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 first of all, they're joint CDF. It's completely analogous to the individual CDF. So the joint CDF is the function, it's a function of two variables now, f of x, y equals the probability x less than or equal to x, y less than or equal to y. Similarly, we have a joint PMF in the discrete case. which would just be the probability that x equals little x, y equals little y, right? So if we just add this part, that's the PMF. The joint PMF means we're considering both of them together, okay? Now, in the case where they're independent, if x and y are independent, that means that this uh, joint PMF is the product p of x equals x times p of y equals y. So, so, we, so we need, so that's called the joint CDF, joint PMF. And now, this, so this is when we're considering them together, right? Because it's comma within the same P, right? It, it's, it's considering them jointly, okay? If they're independent, that's, that's equivalent to independence, is, is that you can split the, the, this up, okay? So now there's another concept that we need called marginal. The marginal distribution, marginal just means take, take them separately. So the marginal distribution would, you know, for, for x would be probably x less than or equal to x is, is called the marginal of, of marginal distribution of x. Similarly, marginal PMF would just be just this part, okay? So, so therefore, in words, we could say that marginal um, independence means that the, the joint distribution, the joint CDF is the product of the marginal CDFs. Okay, and similarly, we, we have, we can continue this over here, um, we have the notion of a joint uh, PDF I'm, I'm doing kind of discrete and continuous together because that they're analogous to each other and they're analogous to the one-dimensional case. Uh, so joint PDF, which we might write as little f of x, y, such that, so, so this would be the continuous case in two dimensions. What, is it, what does it mean to, to be a joint PDF? What that, just, just like in the one dimensional case, the one dimensional case, the, the PDF is what you integrate to get a probability, okay? Two dimensional case, same thing. If we wanna know what, what's the probability that X and Y are in some set, uh, let, let's say X, Y is in some set, B, where, where B is, is some region in the plane, you know, maybe it's a rectangle, may, maybe, maybe it's a circle or something, it's just, just some, some, you know, imagine some area in the plane, then, then what we do is integrate over that region f of x, y, dx, dy. Um, so, I mean, so that's the first time we've written down a double integral here, but as, as far as we're concerned, for, for the most part, uh, d double integrals, we, we, we're, for this course, the double integrals, we're not going to need to do a lot of them, and when we do, normally we can just think of it as one single integral and then another single integral, so just do, do two integrals. Um, but, but, you know, the, in the intuition should be clear, right, that the, the PDF is what you integrate to get a probability, so it's completely an analogous. And um, so independence means that We've already, you know, we've already talked about this before. I'm just using new terminology for it. Independence means that the, the joint X and Y are independent if and only if the joint uh, CDF is the product of the marginal CDFs. So I'll call that, just for, just for emphasis, I'll, I'll call, the, it would be confusing to use the same letter F here without any clarification. This is, this is the marginal CDF of X. This is the marginal CDF of, of Y. This is the joint CDF, okay? 
So it says that instead of having to do some kind of complicated joint thing, I can just find this, the probability of this event times the probability of this event. So, so that's the definition of independence. But you know, we've seen over and over again that usually it's easier to use PDFs or PMFs. So uh, it's equivalent. It's not too difficult. It's a little bit t tedious, but, but you know, with, with, with some algebra, we can show that it's the same thing as saying the joint PDF, PMF is the product of the marginal PMFs. That's in the d discrete case. And in the continuous case, that the joint PDF is the product of the marginal PDFs. And I want to emphasize that this has to be for all x and y, not just for x and y that make this thing positive. You have to pay attention to the zeros also. We'll see an example like that later. Uh, so for all real x and y, we can't restrict it. All right, so coming back to this uh, simple li little example, we can make up any, any four numbers we want as long as they're non-negative and add up to one. So I made up a f four numbers ju just for the sake of example, two-sixths, one-sixth, two-sixths, one-sixth. So I made up a simple little example here. And I, I could ask the question, are x and y independent? And um, to, to answer that, we, we, we need to, to say, well, two, two, two ways we can think about it. One would be, so I, so I wrote this in terms of you know, joint, joint CDF, joint PMF. We could also write something like conditional, right? Uh, that, that is, independence means if you want the distribution of y given that x equals something, it doesn't actually depend on the, the x part. So it's, it's the same as the unconditional distribution. OK, so well, anyway, so e each number in this table is, is one of the joint probabilities, right? So 2 sixths is the probability that x and y are both 0. 1 sixth is the probability that they're both 1, and, and so on. OK, so, so to check that they're independent from the, from the definition, well, what, what that means is we, we, we first need to find the, the, the marginal distributions and, the, and, the, and then check, check that, that this is, is true. Okay. Now, to get, from, to get from the marginal to the joint, um, so just, here's just to quickly, how do, how do we get marginal distributions? Getting marginals is actually pretty easy fr fr from the joint distribution. Because well, let's just do the discrete case uh, first. If we want to know the marginal distribution of x as the marginal PMF, then just, just by the axioms of probability, all we have to do is add up the different possibilities for y. So that's the sum over all y, p of x equals x, y equals y. Okay. Because just, just the axiom of probability, right, that we're, we're adding up disjoint cases, the union is this. You can also write it as a conditional. You can also think of this as the law of total probability and write given y equals y times p of y equals y, it would be the same thing. Okay, that just says add up, you know, x equals x, but y could be anything, so we sum o over y. So that's called marginalizing over y, that we're just summing up. We start with this thing that's a function of x and y, sum over all y, then we just get a function of x. And in, in the uh, continuous case, let, let, let's get the marginal, uh, so that's the discrete case. In the continuous case, let's say we want the marginal distribution of y. Similarly, you can get the marginal distribution of y. I'm not going to write the same thing again. If you want the marginal PDF, so this is the marginal PDF of y. Marginal just means viewing it on its own, as, as its own thing, right? Then all we have to do is integrate, completely analogous to this, integrate the, the joint density, f of xy, xy, integrate over all x. That's just the continuous analog of that. Here we're summing over all values. I swapped the x and y here just for, for variety. Here we're summing over all values of y. Here, here we're integrating over all values of x, the joint, uh, the joint density. Okay. So, so we can go in that direction. This is getting mar marginal distributions from joint distributions. You can't go in the other direction because the margin. If, if we only know the marginal distributions, that doesn't tell us anything about how x and y are related to each other, right? So you can't go in the other way. 
but you can go from, from the joint distributions to the marginal distributions. Okay, so for this example, let's, let's get the marginal distributions. Uh, so what's the probability that y equals zero? Well, obviously we're just adding this case plus this case, right? Because those are the two cases where y equals zero. So we add those two cases, we get four sixths. Add these two cases, we get two sixths. And, 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 and for the other way around, if we want the probability x equals zero, just add this case and this case, and we get three sixths, or one half. This one plus this one, three sixths. Um, and by the way, one thing you have to be careful about is, is, is the terminology in economics and statistics is very different. And, and when you take an econ class, you always hear about marginal revenue and marginal cost and things like that. And, and usually, like in like AP econ, then they don't want to use calculus. And so they explain everything as like, you know, incremental. If you do one more unit of something, then what, what happens? And then later, when you actually see what's going on with calculus, you, you realize that in econ, marginal means derivative. And in statistics, marginal means integrate. <laughs> so it's a completely opposite meaning. And I don't know where the econ term came from, but you can see here where the statistics term came from. because It's called marginal because we write these numbers in the margins. So that's a marginal distribution. So, so once you understand this two by two table, you, you basically have, have the key intuition in, into joint distributions. So, okay, so in this case, um, here they are independent in this example. To check that they're independent, by the def there are other ways to do it, but to, just to check it by the definition, what independence means is that to compute any of these entries, let's say 2, 6, all I need to do is find the probability that x equals 0 times the probability that y equals 0. So I would multiply 3, 6 times 4, 6, which is 1 half times 2 thirds is 1 third, which is this. So to get this number, I, I could multiply this times this, and, and, and so on. So you could check these four numbers. So each of, each of these joint probabilities is, is obtained by just multiplying two marginal probabilities. So that means they, they are independent. Whereas, you know, you can make up your own examples. If, if you just, here, here's kind of an extreme example. It doesn't need to be this extreme. Uh, but I can pick whatever numbers I want as long as they're non-negative and add up to, to uh, one. So, so. For example, I just made one up here uh, where these non-negative add up to one. So this is a perfectly valid jo joint distribution. But you, you can see right away that with th th this uh, zero me means it, it's, it's not going to be true that if, if you multiply, you know, you, you, can't, you can't obtain it that way because if you, if you add, uh, do the marginal thing again, one half, one half, and this is one quarter, three quarters and you multiply one fourth times one half, you don't get zero. So, so these would be, this one would be dependent. This one is dependent. You can make up your own examples. It doesn't have to have a zero in it to make it dependent. That was just an easy ex extreme case to see what, what, what's, what's going on. Okay, so this is a simple two-dimensional uh, discrete example to think about. Let, let's also do one simple continuous example ju just, just to have some, some more intuition. Uh, on what, what this all means. So the simplest way to start, I think, would be with a uniform distribution. What, what does uniform in two dimensions mean? So let's, let's consider, as an example, what if we have uniform uh, on the square That, that can, that's all x, y, such that x and y are both between 0 and 1. So we just have this square here. You know, we can draw, draw our coordinates and have a square here where this is 1 and this is 1. Okay, so we have this square. And we want a distribution that's uniform over this square. So, so remember in the discrete case, uni, I mean, in the one-dimensional case, uniform meant that the PDF was constant on some interval, okay? So the analogous concept would be, we want a PDF, which is gonna be a joint PDF, and we want it to be constant on that square, and zero outside the square, right? So that, that just captures the notion of being, you know, completely random point. As we're picking a random point, x comma y, 
we want a completely random point in, in the square, so we want the density to be constant all over that square. So zero outside. Let's find the joint PDF. Well, the joint PDF, therefore, from what I just said, is some constant C when um, if x and y are both between 0 and 1, and 0 otherwise. Now, um, in one dimension, if you, integrate, uh, if you integrate the number 1 over some interval, you get the length of the interval. Uh, in two dimensions, if you integrate the constant 1 over some region, you get the area of the region. So, so if, if we integrate this thing, we, we get the area. Uh, so the integral, uh, integral is area. So C equals 1 over area would, would normalize it, which, which equals 1, because the area of that square is, is 1. So the joint PDF uh, would just be 1 inside here and 0 outside. And if you want the marginal distributions, then just in, integra integrate out the, you know, integrate this dx or integrate this dy, you'll get 1. Um, so marginally, Um, X and Y are independent uniform, which is pretty intuitive, uniform 0, 1. Which is kind of intuitive, right? Because it just says if you pick a random point in the square and the X coordinate is uniform, the Y coordinate is, is uniform. So that, that's pretty straightforward. That's an example of independence. But I want to contrast that uh, with an example of dependence, where instead of a square, let's, let's use a circle. So suppose we want uniform on the, on the, uh, in the circle. I'll say disk for clarity. A circle might just mean the circle. We want everything inside. So on the disk, uh, x squared plus y squared less than or equal to 1. OK? So let's see what, what that looks like. So we just draw a, cir a circle. Sorry, it doesn't look like a very good circle. But pretend that that's a perfect cir circle centered at 0 of radius 1, and we want to be uniform in here, OK? We want to write down what's the joint PDF, what's, what are the marginal PDFs, OK? So first of all, for the joint PDF, but by the, the same kind of reasoning, it's just because it's uniform, that, 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 that means uh, another way to say uniform is that the probability of some region must be proportional to its area, right? It's analogous. In one dimension, I said pr probability is proportional to length for a uniform distribution. Here, probability is proportional to area. So because of that, the normalizing constant has to be 1 over the area of the circle, pi r squared. So, so that's pi. So the joint PDF is 1 over pi inside the circle and 0 outside. And a common mistake with this kind of thing is, is to then think, think that, oh, that, that says that they're independent because this, this is just a constant, so it, it, it doesn't, you know, it, it, it looks like it factor, I can factor 1 over pi as like constant times a constant, it's just a constant. But, they, but they're not independent because, because of this constraint. Uh, they're actually very dependent because, for example, if x is 0, then y could be anywhere from minus 1 to 1. But if, but if x is close to 1, then, then y has to be in some tiny little interval, right? So, so, so if, we, if we fix x to be here, then y could be between here and, and, and here, right? So, we, so the, the, the values uh, de depend on, on, on where, you know, where, where, that is, knowing x constrains the possible values of y. That, that says that they're not in, independent. So here, x and y are dependent. And we can, in fact, we can show that uh, given that x equals x, then, then we can actually say, well, well what, what, what can y be, right? y has to be between uh, square root 1 minus x squared and minus that, right? Because x squared plus y squared less than or equal to 1. So this depends on x. So this is the constraint, OK? So we, we might guess that y is uniform between here and here. That is, if x is here, then y, we know it's between here and here, but could, could be anywhere, right? 
So a good guess would be uniform, uh, but n next time we'll do an integral to, to show that for, for, for practice. But you can see right now that they're dependent. Okay. So see you on Friday.